Until Europeans began to expand around the world 500 years ago, tribal societies still occupied large parts of all of the continents. Those tribal societies, which constituted all human societies for most of human history, are far more diverse than are our modern big societies. All big societies that have governments and where most people are strangers to each other are necessarily similar to each other and are different from tribal societies in many basic ways, regardless of whether our big societies are Japanese, American, Chinese, Israeli, German, or Argentinian. Tribes constitute thousands of natural experiments in how to run a human society. They constitute experiments from which we ourselves may be able to learn. Many traditional societies make better use of their elderly and give their elderly more satisfying lives than we do in our modern big societies. Paradoxically, nowadays, when we have more elderly people than ever before, living healthier lives and with better medical care than ever before, old age is in some respects more miserable than ever before. The lives of the elderly are widely recognized as constituting a disaster area of modern American society. We can surely do better by learning from the lives of the elderly in traditional societies. The treatment of the elderly varies enormously among traditional societies, from much worse to much better than in our modern societies. At the worst extreme, many traditional societies get rid of their elderly in one of five increasingly direct ways. The most indirect method to get rid of your old people is just to neglect them. The second method of getting rid of older people is to abandon them. The next method to get rid of older people is to encourage them to commit suicide. A fourth, more direct method is to kill older people with their own cooperation. The fifth and most direct method of getting rid of the elderly is to kill them without their consent or cooperation. One is in nomadic hunter-gatherer societies that often shift camp and that are physically incapable of transporting older people who can't walk when the able-bodied young people already have to carry their young children and all of their physical possessions. The other condition for abandoning or killing old people is in societies living in marginal or fluctuating environments, such as the Arctic or deserts, where there are periodic food shortages, and occasionally there just isn't enough food to keep everybody alive. In fact, many of us here have already faced or will face an ordeal similar to the ordeal faced by those nomadic or arctic or desert peoples when you are the physician or when you are the relative responsible for the medical care of an old person and when you are the one who has to decide whether and when to halt further medical interventions and when instead just to administer painkillers and sedatives for a sick spouse or parent.
There are two main sets of reasons for this variation among societies in their treatment of old people. The variation depends especially on the usefulness of old people and also on the society's values. One use of older people in traditional societies is that they are often still effective at producing food. Another traditional usefulness of older people consists of babysitting their grandchildren. Another traditional use of older people is in making tools, weapons, baskets, pots, and textiles. Older people usually are the leaders of traditional societies, and the people most knowledgeable about politics, medicine, religion, songs, and dances. Finally, older people in traditional societies have one more huge significance that would never occur to us in our modern literate societies, where our sources of information are books and the internet. In contrast, in traditional societies, without writing, older people are the repositories of information. Their knowledge is what spells the difference between survival and death for the whole society in a time of crisis caused by rare events of which only the oldest people still alive have had experience. The other set of reasons for variation in treatment of the elderly is the society's cultural values, which vary somewhat independently of the usefulness of the elderly. Filial piety means obedience, respect, and support for elderly parents. Cultural values that emphasize respect for older people, such as filial piety, contrast with the low status of the elderly in the United States. The high status of the elderly in East Asia is based on the Asian emphasis on filial piety. But the low status of elderly Americans arises from several American values that replace filial piety. One is what's called our Protestant work ethic, which places high value on work. So older people who are no longer working are not respected. Another reason for the low status of the elderly in the US is our American emphasis on the virtues of self-reliance and independence so that we instinctively scorn older people who are no longer self-reliant and independent. Still a third reason is our American cult of youth. Big changes for the better include the facts that today we enjoy much longer lives much better health in our old age, and much better recreational opportunities. Another change for the better is that we now have specialized retirement facilities and programs to take care of our older people. Changes for the worse begin with a cruel reality that we now have far more old people and fewer young people than at any time in the past. That means that all of those old people are more of a burden on the few young people and that each old person has less individual value. Another big change for the worse in the status of the elderly in the modern US and Japan is the breaking of social ties with age. Because older people and their children and their friends all move and scatter independently of each other many times during their lives. 
Yet another change for the worse in the status of the elderly is formal retirement from the workforce, carrying with it a loss of work relationships and a loss of the self-esteem associated with work. Perhaps the biggest of all changes for the worse in the status of our elderly is that objectively they have lost much of their usefulness that they had in traditional societies. One value of older people is that they are increasingly useful for offering high quality child care as more and more younger women enter the workforce and as fewer young parents of either gender stay home as full-time caretakers of their children. A second value of old people is paradoxically related to their loss of value as a result of changing world conditions and technology. At the same time, older people have gained in value today precisely because of their unique experience of former conditions that have now become rare because of rapid change, but that could come back. The remaining value of older people that I'll mention involves recognizing that while there are many things that older people can no longer do, there are other things that they can do much better than can younger people. A challenge for Japanese and American society today is to make use of those things that older people are actually better at doing. All of us here today are accustomed to living in big industrial societies, living in permanent housing with centralized governments to make decisions, with writing and books and the internet, where most of us live past age 60, where we are accustomed to meeting strangers just as today I'm meeting many of you who are strangers, and where most of us eat food grown by other people. We forget that all of those things arose only very recently in human history. Humans have constituted a separate biological line of evolution for about six million years, but almost all of those things that I just mentioned didn't exist anywhere in the world 11,000 years ago. That is, the ancestors of all of us here were living under traditional tribal conditions until virtually yesterday measured against the time scale of human evolution. Dr. Diamond. In this changing environment, under the long history of the Earth, what kind of a situation are we facing right now? We are at a unique moment in the history of the Earth. In the past, it was always possible for a human population to grow and for humans to consume more. But today, we are already consuming 80% of the energy of sunlight. In short, today we humans are on a non-sustainable course. We are not in equilibrium with the world's resources. We are depleting the world's forests. We are depleting the world's fish. We are depleting the world's topsoil. We are depleting the world's fresh water. You can calculate at the rate at which human consumption is growing, how many more years will it be before we run out of water and forests and fish? Roughly 30, 40, at most 50 years. By the time I'm, by the year about 2050, 
one can say that by the year 2050, it's all going to be settled whether humans will have a good future or not. If by 2050, we've succeeded in adopting a sustainable economy, then humans can go on for centuries. But the decision is up to us because all these problems of water, fish, and topsoil, they're problems that we are causing. If we choose to stop causing the problems, then we can go on to have a happy, sustainable future. Come back in 38 years, and if I'm still alive, ask, ask me the question again. Did we solve our problems? I don't know. Thank you.